So I, I will talk about the work of many, many, many people, including Tara Pavella, John Chow, Oops. <laughs> There. Um, because Catan and probably other people who are here in the room, even like Francis Wignet is there, but he's not here yet. He will be soon. He's about to arrive, I hope. And um, this is the um, cancer staging. So the World Survey was a survey we ran from Toronto about cancer. In order to have data for the new 2017 version of the official TNM cancer staging. And then uh, we'll, uh, the people who made all this happen, the survey data and the e-cancer care, are my team in uh, the health informatics research unit. And we're very happy that we have Shen Yu Zhang, he calls himself Jeffrey in Canada, um, from Beijing, who is in Toronto now for six months. And he's working very much on all these projects. So the survey was mainly focused on finding out all the different classifications of the amount of disease in one eye. Which, how did that predict outcome to save the eye without use of radiation? So failure is defined as eye salvage. Failure free is saving the eye without needing to use external beam radiation. Black doesn't count. It's considered focal therapy. And the first classification was Elsmer's, which was very complicated because it depended on which part of the eye the tumor was in and all that stuff. But it's actually got some interesting predictions in it that are still accurate. For example, the orange line, group 5B, Elsmer's is vitreous seat. That's still the most difficult part of retinoblastoma to treat. So that was very smart. And in fact, yes. Um, then uh, in Paris in 2003, I think, at the uh, is get our meeting, perhaps, or was it ISO? I don't know. Sorry? Was ISO meeting? In 2003? Anyway, it doesn't matter. It was 2003. Uh, Lynn Murphy had worked, who was at Children's Hospital LA, had worked for many years with all of us to define an ABCDE <coughs> classification. A was a really excellent eye that you could get a good result with nothing but a laser, and E was meant enucleation in what Lynn Murphy described. And um, in 2005, he published that, and that's the results of the survey, the survey from 18 centers in 13 countries. It was more than 3,000 eyes with retinoblastoma. It is the data that went in to hear the outcome. The same data is analyzed by each of the different classifications in this slide. And uh, you can see here is the Murphy classification. The patients in the interval of dates of diagnosis is from 2001 to 2011. So that's the window of the kind of treatment that the children have. So you can imagine after 2011, we may save more eyes because of intravitreal chemotherapy, for example. But that's not what this is measuring. Um, we also did a study uh, in Toronto, same, we had almost the same numbers, looking at long, long, long time ago, and it's never been published. And we, it, those dates of diagnosis were um, 1997 to 2001, which is why we picked 2001 to 2011 for this study. So Terry Pravella is the genius who's going to do more detailed analysis on, the new, on all of this data. And we've also sent him our old data from the 97 to 2001. So that will be fascinating to compare the different treatments, the different approaches in those two time windows in 3,000 kids in each study. Uh, but that's not been done yet. You can expect some brilliant papers that will come up from Gerald's group. Um, and in the Murphy edition of ABCDE, this is A, B, C, D, E. Oops. You don't even need to touch it. It knows you're there. So uh, it's not working quite right. The E's are not flagged properly. So that's interesting because in the Murphy edition, things like tumor touching lens was an E feature. Some labs, some institutions, some clinical groups 
could score that as an E, and some would not believe it was touching the lens or that it didn't belong with E, so there's confusion in that. In 2006, uh, the Philadelphia group published another version. The eye, this is international intraocular retinoblastoma classification. That's what the Murphy one is. This is international classification for RB, I think, okay. something like that. Um, and they're very significantly different. Look at the difference in the outcomes. Exactly the same children going through Murphy versus the shields. And you can see that A and B are fine. They're pretty close. Um, but here, C, D, and E are all together. There's no difference. So there's no difference in the outcome to save an I, C, or E. And the big difference, which this slide doesn't show, is that in the Murphy, the size of the tumor didn't matter. It didn't impact on the outcome. But in the shields, any eye that had a tumor greater than 50% of the volume of the eye was an E. So it put a lot of eyes into E that otherwise might even be C. <coughs> That's a big problem. And yesterday in the talks in the meeting over the last few days, um, I, when the people would show the classification they used, it was almost always shields because I could look at the E category and see if there's a 50% there, even if it's all in Chinese, if there's 50% there, it's shields. But the people doing the work don't know which it is. They will tell me it's Murphy, but it's not. So it's very, very confusing. So um, the seventh edition of the TNM was no better. It was still very confusing, very difficult. Um, it was not a good classification. Um, and once we'd done the survey, a big group of people worldwide worked on a new TNM. So this is now what's come out as the um, AJCC Cancer Staging Manual in the Retinal Bustone chapter, um, which has been led by Ashley Malapatna, who's now in Australia. And <coughs> we took the same data and put it through the new classification that we've done using this data to shape the classification combining that with a lot of consensus. We had many meetings talking on the phone around the world to decide what the exact terms should be. And you can see it does a pretty good job. The A's and B's are the same. Um, the, uh, it separates out T2A and T2B very nicely. I'll tell you what those mean. And this would be equivalent of E. But we didn't have all the features in the new classification in the survey, so the E group only scores, this is only um, scoring for, um, oh, that should, that's, that should be a D, not a 2. <laughs> that's interesting. I never noticed that before. <coughs> um, and and uh, it's only scoring for uh, a, a pre presentation of, of uh, orbital cellulitis, which is the very worst feature for outcome to save an eye, which makes sense. So, Although this new staging manual does not become official for all of the bureaucrats and registries until 2018, they just changed it because they can't get ready for 2017, January, so it will be 2018. I suggest that for the I, we should change right now. And, and we've already published one paper with, with the new classification we included that both. So this is actually um, a table uh, and uh, the, in our paper that just came out on October 3rd what also has this classification in it. So it's published and available in ophthalmology. Um, so the T1A is equivalent to A, T1B is equivalent to B, depending on the size of the tumor and its relationship to damaging vision, so it's closeness to the nerve and the fovea. CT2 is clinical, stands for, the C stands for clinical in the system, but the, two, the T2As are subretinal fluid, and the T2Bs are, victory, are seeding anywhere, under the retina or in front of the retina. And that comes from the data from the survey, that uh, previously the C was either fluid or seeding, but it depended on amount. So if it was a very minor amount of either, 
it was a C. If it was a bigger amount, it was a D. And that this, the data shows that the existence of seedings in the vitreous or subretinal is the key factor that should make it a D. So these switch. E's, the terms have changed. Here's the worst one is aseptic or orbital cellulitis. Um, and vice is followed by both of those, you would say the I is gone. It's not, you know, it, that's not. And the E's that have tumor invasion of pars planus, ciliary body, limbs, zonules, etc., becomes a B. Um, although anterior chamber was a big discussion because we're not sure if a seed floating in the anterior chamber makes it a B or not. So that would be the kind of thing that new data for the ninth edition would be, it needs to be collected, etc. The very exciting piece was that we added genetics. <clears throat> and the retinoblastoma is the first cancer to admit that, that genetics has an impact on outcome, which is very exciting. Retinoblastoma is the first cancer to show that, that cancer is a genetic disease. So we keep leading, and that's great uh, in this area. Uh, uh, so HX means that there's unknown or not enough evidence to know if the patient has a mutation. So a unilateral that is not measured, all they have is unilateral disease, you don't know if that's genetic or not. Uh, H, um, H1 means it's proven that they have genetic heritable disease. So any bilateral patient doesn't need the genetic test to prove that they have a, a mutation, nor trilateral. And trilateral could be unilateral in one eye, but a midline intracranial tumor that is clearly um, related if it will be this trilateral. Um, and a family history, but we need to add close family history because second cousins or fourth cousins, both with retinoblastoma, could be two completely independent events, and we've shown that multiple times. But first generation parents, brothers, sisters qualify to give this person the label of H1. And of course, if you studied the blood, molecular definition of uh, showing it's a true mutation that really will damage the gene uh, is, makes the person H1. If it's a variant in the gene, as we were discussing, that doesn't make it H1 until it's proven to be damaging. And back to the H zeros, they're the hardest to prove. <coughs> that there's normal part, that normal is hard to prove. Um, so if you have a tumor, and you can identify the two mutations in the tumor from a unilateral eye, then you can look at blood and say it's neither of them are there to less than 1%. But it's not absolute because the person could be low, low level mosaic. But we, I think, and I'd like to hear from all of you over the next days, I think I would propose that we let less than 1% risk be qualified as H0. We didn't put that in the book and we should have. Um, the ones that are true H0 are a relative. If you know the bilateral or unilateral programs mutation and they have a child who does not carry that mutation, they can't be mosaic. They are true H0. So it's very interesting on a family tree to lay out who's H1, who's H0, and who's HX because you didn't do the test. So this is very exciting. Every breast cancer, uh, Colon cancer, every other cancer should have the same system, but they can't have it till the ninth edition because we got there first. I, I won't go into this, except to ask, I'll leave that up right like that because I'd like you to go on your own computers, put in that URL, it stands for, to help you remember it, E Cancer Care RB. And it's a database, the global database that I showed yesterday briefly. And I'd like you to go on and look at it yourself. You should go and have lunch, and you can come back, and I'll look at it with you in your data. Um, and it's ecancercarerb.techna institute, which is wherever. <laughs> oh, maybe it's logging in. It is. That's really neat. I, I, touched, I touched it by mistake, yeah. and it's logging into the database, so that's okay. But it's techniinstitute.com, uh, I think. Yes. Yes, yeah. dot com. 
Yes, yes. <laughs> it's going to the database. Okay, I didn't intend it to do that. But <coughs> when I, so I will put in demo user user tab. Hope I get this right. Demo one two three four. Ah. Uh, and you were in the password. You were going the password. You I was in the password. Okay. So it's a try. Capital. Oops. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. D. And then. Oh, why is it doing this? That should be a capital D. D. M. O. Two, three. It's two words. No. Uh, maybe it's the. It's all the maybe it's demo. Demo one, two, three. One, two, three. Oh yes. Good. Good. Thank you. Capital D. Yeah. Capital D. Okay. Let's try it again. Capital D. E M O one two three four. Yep, it's, yep. it's doing it. Yeah. So we're in the database now. This is what it looks like when you live. You can do it on your own computer. I'll just really quickly, since we're here, show you T100. These are real patients, mostly. But some Jeffrey has added, and they may not be entered perfectly at this moment because he's working as your meeting here. <laughs> but this one's pretty good. I messed this up yesterday, but I fixed it last night. When I point to that stage EUA, Tells me the date that's on the 22nd of August, etc. And underneath that, by just double clicking, I can get into that exact event. And then you see tabs across the top. Uh, it will go really quickly, but I encourage you to go and look at tumors and findings. And this lets you draw the tumors. In most of the world, in the treatment of retinal blastoma, every I with retinoblastoma has a drawing on a piece of paper, a standardized chart with colored pencils. Active tumor is yellow, <coughs> active is blue, so we've kept those colors. I recognize uh, the way John's seeing retinoblastoma patients, he hasn't got time to draw, uh, but the pictures, the camera pictures, take a picture of this or this or this, and they don't display the whole map. The uh, big advantage of this database is that when you draw the first drawing, it takes you time, but every the next time you do a drawing, you just modify the first the last one. But once you're into state follow-ups, all you do is pull the side, that's the, the last version is what you want to see, and you put it into the next visit. So it actually doesn't take very much time to do it all. And I, I won't edit now because I think we should go to lunch. But you can do edit and then pick up one of these tools and you can change the drawings. You can go back in and, and enter a new patient. Um, so if I go back to timeline and go to patient list, and I welcome you to enter uh, add new patient. Try it. You will have to make up the things that are marked red, you have to do, you'll all be demo institution because this is a real and you put in um, something like this and that will be the patient identification number, you have to make up a name, etc. And then you're free to go in and draw and use all the tools that are there. So I'd love it if you would do that on your own computers and I'm available all, all through the whole week to show you what you've done and, and how to work use it. The advantage of this I now can go back to my slides. How would I do that? Uh, I will close that door. Yeah, that can be done. Sounds good. So this is point of care. So it collects the data at the time in the operating room in sick kids. I always look at it before so I know what the patient had already. Otherwise, I wouldn't remember. That'd be stupid for talking to the parents. Um, 
John doesn't have this database, but he looks at his contact list in his phone before he sees every patient. And he has every detail there. In the World Survey, John centered more patients than anybody else himself. And Harrow discovered that some of the dates of birth weren't right. They couldn't be right. They were after the staging anyway. So he made me go back to everyone. I'd phone John on his cell phone. He'd be in an airport and say, oh, just a minute. Mm -hmm. Oh, the real date of birth is this. So he has it all in his phone. But no one else in the world can do that. So this lets everybody have it. So it's, and it lives a summary of the retinoblastoma related care for the whole lifetime of that person. If they are in Syria and they become a refugee, they have no medical record and no nothing. Their retinoblastoma record will be intact because it's not in Syria. Uh, and uh, all the images, drawings, plans, etc. And it, we intend that this also be identified that, that the people in the circle of care of each child or survivor would have access to this database. They won't be able to make changes in the major part of it, but they'd be able to view it. So when you're finished your examination, if the data's in there, the parents don't, you don't need to hand them a paper picture of one little example of the eye. They can go here and look at it with pictures uploaded. I think that will be a very useful thing, and secretly I'm getting the parents to work for us because they will be the validation team. They won't know that. But when something's wrong, they will tell you that you've got this in the wrong date or you didn't, you've got the wrong eye and you created, you know. So they will be very useful in that way because they won't accept errors in it. And then once the data is all there, um, the, the consent, the two consents, um, which we're working very hard on all the details of how those should be worded, um, a consent for the clinical use, which does not include research, and a separate consent to do research with all sorts of different amounts of research. But the research will be on coded data, even if in one center you want to look at all your patients, to have a group of patients pulled out together for you to study, that would be coded. But it would be reversibly coded. So if you have a brand new drug that might be relevant to one of those patients, there would be a way to go back to that patient in that kind of coded data. But then another type of data will be aggregate data, which will be useful to knowing how many patients there are in the world and the kind of things Tara was talking about. Aggregate data with outcomes, but that would be not able to be reversibly identified. And um, ultimately, we dream that some genius young bioinformaticians making neural networks will study all the data, make algorithms and study it on the fly. So the new diagnosis, the doctors would go here and say, what's the evidence for treatment one, two, three for my child in the context of where I am? And the database would provide evidence. So that won't be randomized clinical trials, which I think maybe are becoming old fashioned because they're not real, they don't apply once you take it under that perfect trial setting. When you get into the real world, it doesn't work the same way. Um, but this will be starting from the real world and we're all sold in Dubai, deciding to pull in data for it. Um, yes? Can just ask, is it only the eye care physicians that will be able to enter data, or will it be like the oncology team? No, there's a whole oncology tab. And included in that is what's the clinical protocol for oncology. Yeah. So you can you can enter a protocol and then you can select that protocol. So there's oncology as well. There's radiation data and there's a whole page of genetics. The genetics is quite interesting. I won't go back to it right now, but we'll look at it. it the layout is not quite perfect unless they fixed it yesterday. But um, the soon any bilateral patient when you select their bilateral, oh the staging is all done automatically here too. Um, then they automatically become H1 if they have rotation identified in blood. But if they <coughs> were HX at diagnosis, because they're unilateral, uh, when you go to the genetic test, which might be two months later, and you enter that they now have a mutation in blood on the front page, it changes from HX to H1. So it's, it's got those features. And please, when you look at it, you may find things that it doesn't have, um, um, which I could, some of the things we dream about are well, bringing the parachutes into it. That's one thing that we will do quickly. We're not building a parent portal. 
like letting them have it all. Why make a lot of work to give them, spoon feed them something that's not going to be adequate? You know? um, very important is the, um, that we used to call this stress scoring. How stressed, how upset are they? Um, there's been a horrible situation in the US where a father was extremely stressed but didn't show that with a child under treatment for retinoblastoma. And um, he killed his child. This has been all over the news. That's extremely upsetting. But nobody knew he was upset because nobody was paying attention to him. So um, I recently met a person when I was in Dublin who happens to be from Toronto. And he said, well, in <coughs> we run drug rehabilitation clinics, he said, we, we don't, which, have, which are, most of them are medically induced by opiates given to them by their doctors. But he says, we don't call it stress anymore. We call it resiliency index. And that would be something, we will rename it like that. And the minute a patient's diagnosed, there would be a process for the family to themselves enter this data. And we'll find out, are they going to be at risk? Or have they got the ability to cope with having a child with retinal last time? That unit is not developed yet, but it's very exciting. And the team that built the whole of e-cancer care has built all of that for all sorts of other cancers. So it's just a matter of us saying, what are the retinoblastoma specific things? They've already got the model built for that. And then the timeline, I showed a timeline that went for five years, but the, um, the timeline will go for the life of the patient. And Guantini will talk this afternoon about the survivorship care plans but they would all be in this. So the entry of their uh, whole body MRI that they need to have would be scheduled and would be on the timeline for the rest of their life, starting whenever it's appropriate for the kind of disease they had, whatever else they need. So that's the idea behind this as a powerful way for all of you to be involved in research. It will also give each center and we'll have all your own data. You can do any of your research you want on your own data, coding. But um, then you can collaborate. You can do it as a country. You can do it as a whole world. And there's a whole process of governance to decide who gets data, what, when, and what things you need to do to have that. I think that's enough. Oh, no. There's many other research things that should be happening. We should be measuring, does this database change quality of care? What are the costs implication of this? Does it make the care cheaper? It's not bias, but I haven't measured it. And measure global uptake. Will people use this? And you are a great test group when you go and play with it. Would you consider putting your own patients in this and see how easy it is once you use it? Um, but then there's a whole lot more research can happen for, for a long time. And um, um, all of that will complement this. Oh, and finally, the learning health system, and I've already